So uh, today I'm very happy to uh, introduce Dr. Sergei Makarov, who is uh, uh, the head of Laboratory of Hybrid Nanophotonics and Optoelectronics Electronics of the Department of Physics and Engineering uh, at the Itmo University. Uh, so Sergei uh, will be talking about perovskite nano and micro lasers. Sergei, please. Uh, yeah, thanks, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> And good morning, dear colleagues. Thanks for coming and listening. Yeah, today I will talk about our recent results on perovskites nano and micro lasers. And uh, yeah, the work was done in uh, Itmo University. And um, yeah, so, and uh, I'm first of all thankful to our team for all people who, uh, with whom we work on this, so who contributed or with whom we discuss a lot on this, uh, in this direction, also to internal and external collaborators. So for everyone who, uh, who did a lot of, to, to, to make all this happen. So um, as an outline of my talk, uh, the following, so I will start from very general introduction and why do we need uh, nano and micro lasers, why perovskites, and also uh, there will be a lot of, um, a new results uh, with most of them uh, will be so uh, most of them uh, are not published yet so any feedback also will be appreciated so I will start from our um, uh, so the, the smallest uh, possible um, perovskite lasers achieved so far uh, coupling of micro perovskite micro lasers uh, with a nano wave guide some spectral tunability of uh, such kind of light integrated light sources. And uh, finally, I will discuss some uh, um, opportunities for how we can um, employ some unique properties of perovskite to scale up this technology um, uh, for of their fabrication. And finally, I will give some outlook and summary. So let's start from uh, Moore's law in photonics. So uh, in electronics, it's uh, like exponential growth of the transistor per, per chip um, with time. So the same story uh, with in photonics. So here there are some uh, some trends, uh, uh, some trends in the uh, increase of number of components on chip for various approaches. And now we can see that uh, we are around uh, uh, 10,000 components per, uh, per chip. Uh, in photonics integrated circuits. And let's uh, look at the this key scheme. Uh, let's compare with electronics. And uh, the first glimpse, uh, it seems to be the huge gap between photonics. So I just uh, draw uh, draw uh, the, the, this trend, uh, I mean, mentioned here on the left side of this uh, presentation here. So you see that there's a huge gap between electronics and photonics. But honestly, uh, so it can be compared directly because uh, we don't have uh, transistors in photonics. There are a lot of components. I will show uh, some building blocks of the uh, photonic uh, circuits. Uh, but still you see that uh, we, 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 we have something to optimize here. And, uh, but uh, nevertheless, we have a lot of differences between photonics chips and electronics. Um, more, so first of all, uh, photonics chips can be much faster this uh, can be target separation speed and even uh, even a higher speed uh, as well as a uh, different or b different functionalities of photonic chips so i will show you some of them and uh, yeah but still if we have such a big difference between uh, between size between uh, uh, trends in this moore's law between photonics and electronics so there are some challenges of course to, uh, to reduce this gap, we have to work on size reduction. So this is of course, just simple geometry, uh, sh shrinkage of designs, of photonic designs. Um, but of course, also we have to think about uh, shifting from infrared photonics to visible photonics, to, to even to shift into UV photonics and so. And also we have to reduce the material costs and fabrication costs. Uh, to make it compatible. And uh, yeah, there is some example of uh, uh, photonics chip. For instance, uh, here you see some uh, sketch of uh, beam steering chip and uh, what it, uh, so the functionality of this chip is the just rotating 
of the beam uh, propagating and emitting from the end of this chip propagating in different angles uh, and the different voltages and uh, let's focus our attention on the uh, such type of building block as a uh, um, amplitude um, modulators or light sources or or lambda converters and so on so on this chip you see here that laser source of course this is should be micro or nano laser and for some uh, amplifiers so everything marked by a uh, red color uh, is uh, related to nano and micro lasers so this is important component in optical uh, chip and uh, what kind of uh, uh, what kind of uh, lasers we can uh, we can imagine so in generally there are several uh, so there are basically two trends in uh, photonics uh, so uh, classical micro micro lasers or nano non or new types of uh, older old electric nano lasers uh, and uh, plasmonic lasers yeah and uh, there is uh, uh, in my opinion there is no strict definition of nano laser uh, so it, it should be like uh, so nano laser one can say that this is a sub wavelength laser um, with sizes less than uh, wavelengths of emitted light. Uh, but uh, from paper to paper, you can find different um, definitions. So, uh, and also, it's important to mention that in many, for instance, plasmonic papers, uh, people just call nano laser when um, only one dimension is uh, deeply sub wavelength, whereas other dimensions are like micro scale, so multi wavelength scale. So in, in our work, we are trying to, to, do, to, to fabricate real sub-wavelength laser uh, in all directions that we call nano lasers. And there are some examples uh, how we can fabricate uh, non-plasmonic um, lasers or, or the electric nano lasers. So there are plenty of some chemical methods of synthesis of semiconductors or uh, chemical vapor deposition methods then uh, can give you single crystalline materials with uh, good emission properties but uh, unfortunately most of them are a bit um, so not a bit but <laughs> considerably uh, uncontrollable so there are you will have a lot of uh, randomly placed on the, um, non and micro crystals on the surface so uh, lithography of course is much better in this regard um, so you can fabricate very nicely arranged and controllable um, with controllable shape of lasers, micro lasers, nano lasers, and of course uh, some different techniques like laser printing um, of lasers made of um, polymers are also available. And regarding plasmonic lasers, uh, there are also plenty of uh, designs, and uh, you can see how they are complicated, so they're quite complicated uh, and advanced. So they were even realized with the electrical pump. Uh, and uh, the main feature here that uh, with electrical pump was we realized mostly ER uh, nano laser, plasmonic nano lasers. Whereas for visible range, there are some examples here and here. You see uh, that this is, uh, this is colloidal uh, nano lasers, this is uh, nanowire based uh, lasers separating invisible range. So invisible range, most of semiconductors um, uh, face some problems with electrical pump due to uh, lower uh, quantum yield of emissions. There is so-called uh, green gap for uh, three, five semiconductors and uh, where, where in green range, uh, quantum efficiency goes down. So there are a lot of problems in visible range. And of course, if we work with metals, metals are quite lossy in visible range. So there are a lot of problems with plasmonic lasers in uh, visible range. And uh, generally, in both these directions, in, uh, in uh, micro lasers, nano lasers, uh, what we have to optimize um, is uh, coupling efficiency between uh, emitters and uh, cavities. So we have to both optimize density of photonic states and this density of electronic states. Uh, so photonic states can be optimized via, uh, so uh, with, with decrease of uh, size of cavity, keeping high uh, quality factor of cavity. Whereas uh, for 
um, whereas for density of states of material in material for electronic states, uh, of course, it's preferential to work with uh, low dimensional materials because if you look at the some kind of uh, uh, solutions uh, of this um, like equations very simple presentation uh, for you know, for instance for density of states we see that for the lower the dim dimensionality of the material so the higher can be in sharper states uh, density of states it means that absorption can be higher if we have high absorption we have strong interband transition if we have strong interband transition we have a high uh, emission quality qu qu quantum efficiency of emission and high gain uh, also excitons uh, in, even in bulk materials can work well uh, in this regard uh, and also it's tempting to um, to go to single mode regime uh, to work in single mode cavity uh, to have uh, the most compact and uh, quite efficient uh, uh, nanolaser so what are the challenges uh, what we can further improve and what are the directions in this field uh, so the first one of course as i told many times uh, the size reduction so for uh, to shrink geometry we have to work uh, with a low order modes if we're talking about uh, dielectric cavities uh, but for this we have to work with so the lower the modern uh, mode order the low uh, the lower quality factors the lower quality factor the higher gain we need for material and also of course we have to work with the high refractive index material uh, to to make it uh, as compact as possible in case of uh, dielectric lasers and of course uh, we have to think about uh, wavelength sh shrinkage and uh, shift from infrared to visible range and of course in this case we have to think about not only lasers but also waveguides which should be loss free invisible range uh, which is quite challenging uh, and also some other optical uh, these bu building blocks which you saw as previous slides uh, all of them should be uh, adapted for uh, for visible range uh, and of course uh, finally it should be electrically pumped room temperature lasers and uh, yeah a few words about cost efficiency of the materials and technology so i will also pay uh, um attention to this to this um, to these parts because it should be quite um cheap and earth abundant for instance in photovoltaics uh, people um, count money very well so and they uh, es estimate uh, estimate a lot of technological issues and uh, um, for instance uh, uh, like each cent per square meter of materials is important yeah, in these quite competitive uh, technologies and this very interesting was for me to found this uh, comparison of production for different materials uh, in this nice um, uh, comment in nature materials uh, henry snyde from uh, oxford just uh, uh, just estimate what if we just replace all um energy generation capacity in the world is around uh, 12 now it's a bit more uh terawatts by photovoltaics for instance and if we would replace it by uh, let's say gallium arsenide 35 semiconductor technology and to produce all of these materials to replace all plants we have to wait uh, 500 years for instance if we would uh, replace it with uh, silicon which is very widespread material very cheap but still we have to wait three years but uh, if we um, we we, if we uh, would uh, replace it with lead based perovskites uh, based on lead yeah you, you see lead is very uh, very very uh, earth abundant and rapidly like uh, mined material uh, from the earth so uh, in this case we have to wait just a few days just a few days so the huge difference regarding materials between three five semiconductors and perovskites halide perovskite lead-based perovskites in the capacity of so this is very earth abundant material and um, very cheap as well so cheaper than silicon so in this case uh, we have to think about this material and uh, uh, and try to to apply it for for uh, Key, key applications in optoelectronics, so very nice optoelectronic materials. 
so for for those who are not familiar with these materials, I will just start briefly briefly from the history of this material. So perovskites, uh, the first form of uh, calcium titanate, it was found as a mineral uh, in uh, Ural Mountains uh, in the uh, so 19th century. Then uh, the structure of perovskites was described by uh, Victor Goldschmidt and this typical structure of perovskites. And there were a lot of different perovskites like um, barium titanate, which are very well known and widely used for uh, for second harmonic generation, for nonlinear optics, uh, for phase modulators, uh, and so on. So there are a lot of uh, useful materials, even for some mat perovskite materials are used for superconductivity. So very wide um, family of, of materials. And uh, halide perovskites, or inorganic halide perovskites, were synthesized uh, in the 20th century or even in the end of 19th century. So it's quite known material. And uh, organic inorganic halide perovskites. So why halide? Because here we have uh, halides, iodine, bromine, and chlorine, uh, which determine a band gap of the material, as I, I will show you later. So this material was studied in, in details in the end of 20th century. Uh, all properties were studied except the photovoltaic properties, unfortunately, for these guys. And, uh, but in the beginning of 21st century, uh, people tried uh, to apply this organic and organic perovskite for photovoltaics applications uh, and uh, now they uh, reach efficiency more than 25 percent for small for small cells and for big models it's uh, still keep growing and now it's around 20 percent so this is really uh, this technology would change the landscape of uh, photovoltaics for sure in the near future and of course, once we have a good semiconductor, it should emit light um, very well. So, and now uh, perovskite LEDs also uh, develop, uh, is a rapidly developing field. They're quite flexible, semi-transparent, bright, efficient, cheap, and so on. So this also a promising technology. And why <clears throat> halide perovskites? Uh, what are the advantages of this material? Yeah, if we compare it with silicon, gallium arsenide, uh, three five semiconductors we see that this halide perovskite has quite tunable uh, easy to tune uh, band gap due to the changing of this anion this last uh, last uh, elements in the formula and uh, it can be changed uh, over a whole visible range um, also the transition is stronger than in for instance in gallium arsenide therefore we have higher absorption uh, for instance here you see the comparison uh, between um, perovskite, this is a methyl ammonium lead iodine perovskite standard for photovoltaics. And this is even better, absorbed even better than uh, epitaxially grown gallium arsenide. So this is quite um, uh, surprising because we just synthesis on spin cultures. It's, you don't need clean room or some uh, expensive facility to grow very nice semiconductor. Uh, and yeah, so you see here the absorption is very good. It's good for photovoltaics. And also for light emission is also quite good because um, uh, in opposite to uh, three, five semiconductors, uh, which are uh, quite defect intolerant materials because uh, many defects, type of defects generated deep traps for uh, carriers and being trapped on this, uh, in these states, carriers cannot uh, go up because of uh, this uh, uh, depth is more than uh, uh, KT, yeah, at room temperature is quite quite big. But for, for perovskites, normally defects are quite shallow and therefore even at high concentration, it still emit light properly and uh, you can use it for as a laser for instance and so on. So I will show you how we apply it, these properties. And regarding perovskites for lasers, uh, there are a lot of uh, works and reviews on this topic, uh, so why it's uh, why it's important for laser? First of all, you see here on the figure R A, so you see that uh, how by playing with just only anions, replacing just playing with bromine, iodine, chlorine, uh, you can just tune very broadly a spectrum of uh, of perovskite micro and nano lasers. Uh, this is example for this example for nanowires perovskite nanowires and also for microplates 
the same story. So it doesn't matter, it can be thin film. There were a lot of designs for nano lasers, uh, for micro lasers, nano lasers, except uh, some very small nanoparticles, which will, I will talk about. And uh, yeah, so the other advantages that the perovskite has an uh, excitons at room temperature, so it's good for gain, also be tunable, uh, refractive index is enough to have a good contrast with substrates, uh, it's very cheap for, to fabricate and high photoluminescence yield. So let's start uh, from um, uh, from our work on uh, the uh, record small uh, perovskite lasers, non-lasers. So first of all, uh, let's ask ourselves that uh, is it possible to excite mirror resonance in perovskite nanoparticles in visible range? So as we show in our uh, this first paper on this topic, so that in quasi-spherical particle, uh, the answer is uh, even for irregular shape uh, quasi-spherical particle, we observe mere resonances. Uh, and uh, then if you analyze the dif different designs, uh, it's quite obvious that uh, with refractive index around 2.5, we should have uh, see, um, um, we, have to, we will see the uh, mere resonances for perovskites of different compositions uh, emitting red light, uh, red light, green light, and blue light. So, but uh, for fabrication of high quality materials with low defect concentration, we have to work with cubic uh, shapes. Why? Because uh, if we grow them chemically, uh, the regular shape of crystal is cubic or cubo cuboic like but not spherical, there is no spherical crystals here, yeah? or disc-like crystals. So mostly uh, crystals look like, uh, like uh, cu cubic, if it's a cubic face, for instance. And therefore, we uh, focus on this shape in our research and uh, synthesize chemically. So you see, this is just simple uh, drop casting of, uh, ah, no, no, here it can be fabricated by drop casting, spin, co spin coating, so just, fabrication in petri dish uh, substrate with a lot of randomly oriented of uh, nano lasers of different of different shapes and uh, remarkably that uh, if we study in uh, electron diffraction a single crystal crystal so they're really a single crystal particle it means that uh, mm, uh, they have a, l a low uh, concentration of defects but still if we uh, if we so uh, it's important to optimize the substrate Nevertheless, so because if we grow them on glass, on amorphous material, uh, we have a lot of defects because there is no, like, uh, uh, um, there is no ma like lattice ma matching between substrate and uh, material, and in this case, uh, there are huge of defects. But nevertheless, so since it's uh, defect uh, like robot defect tolerant material, it still uh, emit light, lazy but at higher threshold. But to, to reduce the size, we have to have material with low defects and high gain. So in this case, we have to uh, reduce the defects anyway. And growing on sapphire gives us very nicely oriented and uh, with a much longer photoluminescence decay uh, cube, cuboid, uh, which, which is quite good for, for, for light emitting applications. And uh, yeah, so uh, Misha, thanks for question. So the uh, as I told you, yeah, the quality um, crucially depends on the substrate material, crucially. So uh, because on glass, uh, on amorphous material, we have a lot of defects in, the, in, the, in this system. If we grow in, for instance, on ITO, it will it will be even worse because if we grow it on uh, some irregular surface, it still grow, it still will emit light, but uh, quality will be a little bit lower. Yeah, it can be uh, H uh, boron, for instance. It can be graphene. It can be TMDC. It can be any material. So it can be absolutely in principle so the problems only with metals yeah uh, hydrophobic yeah uh, but um, so the surface uh, energy is quite important just generally for for growing this yeah so i just stop on
uh, on the issues on material optimization. And then, uh, and then, uh, yeah, let's go to a quality factor optimization of the nano cavities. So previously, there were a lot of works on uh, microplates grown chemically, made of perovskites. It supports uh, visible and gravity molds, nanovirus support, uh, uh, fabripiro resonances, and it was enough for, for lasing in perovskites. But what about nanoparticles? And for uh, from uh, uh, some cal calculation of basic designs for cubic spherical cylindrical shapes, we see that uh, for subwavelength static particles, uh, we have um, we have uh, good uh, quality factors um, for cube uh, for cub cubic shape, and this is uh, quite comparable with uh, with spherical shapes. So in this case, we can say that cubic particles are good enough for lasing applications. And uh, in our work, uh, experimental work, we just focus on the shape and uh, fabricated plenty of uh, different nanocubes. Nano and there are some examples of lasing uh, from them. Uh, so there is, a, uh, there is a figure on D where the typical, typical threshold like appearance of single mode uh, lasing regime above the threshold and for different uh, sizes of nanocubes we see the, there is some part of the luminescence uh, uh, spectrum we see that appearance of threshold above some uh, or appear, appearance of sharp line above some threshold and of course these nanoparticles according to our simulations you see here simulations of scattering of white light from these uh, particles we see there are some uh, peaks co which correspond to uh, so me resonances, especially um, uh, it's easier to uh, to compare the smaller particles where we don't have a lot of uh, high order modes. Here we see broad contribution from overlap um, electric and magnetic dipoles, some contribution from uh, from uh, quadrupoles, and uh, even can be even octopoles can be visible in this spectral range. So with these nanoparticles, uh, we, we did a lot of uh, lasing measurements. So first of all, we define the threshold. We, we confirm that this is really lasing. So by finding the threshold, both spectrally, so this is a, a full width half maximum of spectrum. Uh, and um, you, we, we, we saw the sharp degrees of, uh, so appearance of sharp um, peak and spectrum. Also, we observe some nonlinear growth of intensity uh, of photoluminescence or in lasing regime, we have this um, sharp increase of, of uh, photoluminescence. Uh, so intensity threshold, so affluence of uh, lasing for our nanocubes is around uh, 100, so here, yeah, the answer to this question is here, so on this figure D. Uh, so experimental dots uh, in the, uh, corresponds to right axis. So here you see, uh, here you see that it's above or close to 100 microjoules per centimeter square for femtosecond laser pump, for femtosecond laser pump. Uh, and uh, at some moment in some sizes, we, uh, so for, for smaller particles, we didn't absorb any lasing and uh, it corresponds to, uh, to the regime where we have, uh, we don't have enough gain uh, for, for lasing because for lower, smaller sizes, we have to, uh, so we, we, we have uh, molds with lower, quant uh, with lower quality factor and this quality factor is not enough to compensate uh, all losses in material in, in material and uh, the losses so quality factors time of life in, in the cavity so it's not enough uh, to provide the, uh, enough positive feedback to initiate lasing and uh, the record small nanocubes are around 300 uh, nanometers so and more uh, deep analysis was carried out by uh, Kirill Koshilev and uh, uh, he just uh, made a multiple decomposition 
and uh, reveal the contribution of different multiples to um, to the emission uh, to the uh, lazy mode. So this decomposition corresponds to this uh, nano cube. And here we see dominating of uh, magnetic octopoles, this is third order uh, me mode, and some contribution of magnetic dipoles and other modes. So because of uh, quite broadening and overlapping of different modes in nanocubes. So there is a, uh, also you see optimization on wavelengths. So emission is around 540 nanometers, uh, 30 nanometers. And uh, here we see that uh, coexistence of these two modes and crossing them at some moment. Uh, with sky, uh, we, we're giving the highest quality, quality factor for cubes. And it's more, the most interesting thing is to compare uh, our design with uh, previously published ones. So, uh, uh, so uh, there are there were a number of designs made of different semiconductors, as shown here. And here we normalize the uh, total volume of the design to the uh, wavelength uh, in the material. And we see that uh, our design uh, operating in green range is much smaller than previously uh, previously shown lasers at room temperature and single particles uh, lasers. So uh, because of high gain of uh, perovskites, because of regular shape of the crystals, because of uh, low defect density, so we optimize everything and really uh, really optimize, really optimize these nano lasers to make them as small as possible. So this is the final result of this part, and then uh, we are we are ready to. Uh, so now we are ready to integrate this uh, such kind of uh, micro lasers, nano lasers, with other uh, with with waveguides. So to build a, a, some a photonic chip, and uh, so for this we have to find the material first of all. Uh, which would uh, support waveguiding with low losses in the visible range. And um, so let's look at the, uh, the, this big family of semiconductor material, materials. And here we have a so-called more slow, uh, indicating that the wider band gap, the, the lower refractive index of material. But uh, if we want to have high optical contrast to better uh, to higher localization uh, we we have to have higher refractive index and uh, in our case uh, in this case so gallium phosphate is really outstanding material this is out of this trend and it has uh, almost no losses in this part of in this spectral range these dots are indicate uh, the edges uh, of yeah mr you're right <laughs> you uh, your comment on that we we have to we have to go to photonic computer is absolutely correct. So I'm working on the, at least my electronic computer does that. So I have to do something. Uh, so yeah. So in and if we look at the gallium phosphide, now we see uh, and uh, we can compare it with a perovskite which emit light in green range as shown um, in the figure B uh, by green uh, green zone. And here you see that almost uh, almost zero losses for for gallium phosphide, and in this case we can think about um, uh, good wave guiding properties in this range and in red range. So next slide, please. Yeah, so such kind of uh, gallium phosphide nano wave guides can be fabricated by uh, molecular beam epitaxy um, by our partners uh, from Academic University in Saint Petersburg. Uh, in the group of um, uh, Ivan Muchin. And uh, the advantages of this method that this nanowires can be fabricated and then easily transferred to the substrate, to any substrate. Uh, this is uh, some kind of advantages uh, over lithography, lithography methods, because in this case we have uh, good high crystallinity, uh, high crystallinity of uh, gallium phosphide, some thinning doesn't affect too much uh, optical properties of, uh, for wave guiding. Uh, and yeah, this such kind of objects are very, uh, very useful for integration. And next slide, please. And how we can integrate uh, perovskites with uh, such kind of nanowave guys. 
So um, uh, this this method was uh, proposed by Anatoly Pushkarov in our group uh, when uh, uh, he just put a uh, laser ink, so-called uh, so some mixture of salts of, for creation of perovskites, and uh, none, none is shown here. None virus just uh, like swimming in this uh, in this uh, liquid in this droplet, and then. Uh, Micro lasers uh, grow uh, on uh, this uh, nanowires as uh, as on seeds, so there are no uh, almost no grow any of like uh, nanowires free microcrystals, and almost all these um, microcrystals grow on uh, on nanowires. So next slide, please. And here, you, yeah, you see the results. So normally on the sample, we we observe a lot of uh, microcrystals, uh, perovskite microcrystals, which integrate automatically integrated nano waveguides because they grow just uh, around these nano waveguides. And uh, as compared with previous works on plasmonic nanowires, uh, which were integrated with um, perovskite uh, microcrystals, my, uh, micro lasers uh, with plasmonic nano waveguides with almost the same localization. So the diameter was around uh, also 200 nanometers, and but uh, propagation length for such gallium phosphide um, nanowires is much better. So almost three orders of magnitude longer uh, propagation, better higher high tra transmittance for such a design. So this is results of our calculations. So please uh, next slide. Yeah. So. Uh, this is the TM image of uh, the typical design, uh, and uh, due to de uh, defect tolerance of the material, so even growth of uh, non perovskites and nanostructure inside uh, the micro lasers, micro lasers still preserve their uh, good uh, luminescent and lasing properties. So, and here there is demonstration of single mode. Outcoupling laser, laser uh, outcoupling of lasing emission from the uh, from the top of this waveguide. So the spectra which you see is collected from the very end of the waveguide. So um, yeah. So and moreover, uh, we can integrate some other things uh, to such a system. For instance, here you see that integrated. Uh, waveguide uh, just uh, help to um, outcouple uh, light laser mode from uh, from from skies and the, on the on the second facet of this waveguide uh, there are a lot of energy because of almost no losses in this waveguide in green range and then we can attach um, attach nanoparticle of another perovskite by like uh, almost I would say the pick and place method, some modification of this. And uh, we can lighten up this another perovskite nanoparticle, uh, which should emit light in green range. And uh, in figure B, instead of figure B, we see that we really like lighten up this nano antenna by, uh, by emission from perovskite micro laser. And then uh, this emission also can be outcoupled to a uh, second waveguide and in point three in the very end of second waveguide we again can uh, we observe some signal both from uh, from micro laser and both from this uh, perovskite nanoparticles or well, basically it can work as a nano antenna because the size of this particle is uh, corresponds to so there are some uh, MIMOs as well and yeah, this is an uh, example of uh, uh, such integrated designs in with different pair of skies, which can be fabricated with this uh, with this approach. And yeah, next slide, please. Yeah, and moreover, uh, so pair of skies are quite tunable material, so we can try to tune such uh, kind of integrated light sources on a substrate just uh, in situ. So next slide, please. Yeah, due to tunability, so we can just play with uh, halides, you replace bromine by iodine or chlorine. We can tune um, the band gap of the material. So here's this ellipsometry data, 
for, in, figure, in figures C and D and refractive index, uh, we, see, we see how the band gap is changing over more than one electron volt by a doping with uh, H chlorine, just in petri dish, in vapor phase. Um, it can be thin film, it can be nanoparticles, it can be uh, any, any micro or micro object. So this is a very uh, uh, And then, yeah, please, next slide. Yeah, and uh, we apply it also for integrated design uh, where we have a micro laser and uh, nano waveguide made of gallium phosphide and just uh, put it in a petri dish in H iodine uh, vapor, this is acid, uh, and which doped, uh, doped uh, our bromine perovskite. So we just replace bromine to iodine and you can see. Um, you can see that it, how it can be tuned. And uh, gallium phosphide waveguide still uh, support waveguiding even in red range, in green range, so it doesn't matter. So, and we also show, uh, in principle, so we, 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 we showed that uh, this reversible process, uh, so I don't have this nice slide for this, but you can believe me. And yeah, so, this is how such integrated design can be tuned in C to mm. uh, very rapidly so just a couple of minutes. And yeah, next slide, please. Yeah, and final uh, part of my talk will be about scaling up of the fabrication technique because um, uh, there are some, of course, the uh, chemical methods are good for high quality nanocrystals, microcrystals grow. Um, but the disadvantage is that they're quite randomly oriented you know, on a substrate and one has to op optimize uh, their positioning and size control. It's uh, quite tricky. Uh, and also, if you want to apply nanolithography for creation uh, uh, of sky based designs, so many of them of standard methods are quite uh, harmful for perovskites because it's this ionic material and uh, any polar liquids would dissolve it uh, completely. So we have to um, create some high throughput and some, um, some uh, quite cheap method for fabrication of nanostructures. And uh, we, we should employ, uh, of course, again, the defect tolerance of this material and uh, low thermal conductivity. So next slide, please. And yeah, uh, what happens if we apply femtosecond laser pulses to uh, to damage the perovskite film? This is an example of a uh, polycrystalline thin film made of uh, this uh, uh, metal ammonium lead iodine perovskite. And here we apply different laser laser beams of Gaussian beam, flat top beam, uh, squared shape beam. And interestingly, that first of all we can uh, create very um, very accurate uh, edges of such holes, and moreover, uh, incomplete ablation. Yeah, on the in the lower part, uh, left SM image, uh, we see that this is an incomplete uh, laser ablation, and uh, there is no overheating and damage of the material residual material uh, after ablation. And we see on the confocal. Um, Confocal photoluminescence images. Scan, uh, after scanning of this area, we see that luminescence because becomes even better due to passivation of surface and uh, annealing effects. So, uh, next slide, please. Yeah, and uh, yeah, let's apply this technique for creation of uh, micro lasers, uh, some light emitting designs, and in our first work. We uh, we ap applied face uh, face plate to uh, to form a donut shaped laser beam and uh, with high topological uh, charge. So it was around five, is it, if I remember correctly. So we we managed to create a quite thin uh, like donut shaped uh, uh, beam uh, and with thin like walls and to cut. Uh, Create lasers with uh, support 
uh, this filling will remove. So this is just direct uh, cutting from a thin film on a glass mm -hmm. tube tray. And next slide, please. Yeah, so this technology is uh, quite uh, cheap and fast. So we managed to fabricate uh, one square centimeter just for uh, like 15 minutes and creating around a billion of micro lasers. And uh, it can be near ER lasers, it can be green lasers, and so on. So different. Uh, Different proscats can be processed by these methods. So, uh, Ivan, yours ask uh, where the special coherence of such an array. Uh, uh, so, yes, um, we um, we so how we can estimate it? Of course, we uh, uh, we didn't check it in, in inter, by interferometric uh, some additional interferometric setup, but from um, looking at the emission of these micro disks, we observed all this uh, transition from smoothly uh, emitting, like homogeneously emitting light to some uh, transition to like fringes, interferometric uh, fringes of uh, the emitted light. So, far field when we collect. Okay, so uh, Anton, maybe can you read these questions because they just appeared and disappeared in my. Uh, 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 yes, so Konstantin Simovsky wanted to ask questions. Uh, I'm, I, I can switch you on the microphone. Thank you. Uh, could you please uh, tell why a cubic uh, geometry with mirror resonances is more advantageous than the disk geometry with whispering gallery resonances? I did not catch this point. Yeah, thanks for the question. So uh, I can say that for uh, so previously, if we go maybe Gosha, can you go back? So for for disc uh, for discs, uh, we which we cut by uh, by a femtosecond lasers, we have a quite rough uh, surface. So maybe if we would have a perfect uh, single crystalline or uh, like with huge grains. Uh, single crystalline grains film and we just cut accurately by laser micro discs uh, we would preserve uh, and and we would preserve a good uh, luminescent properties of the materials do not generate a lot of some defects so maybe in this case micro discs can be uh, like compatible with uh, the smear resonances uh, laser but I would stress again that for cubes, this is very important that uh, they have very good um, uh, light emitting properties by themselves because they're single crystalline. Uh, this is one, one, one of the most important things. They single crystalline, they have uh, high gain, they, they have high gain, and in this case, we can uh, work even at low. Uh, Q factors with lower Q factors because if you go further, um, yeah, unfortunately, I, I don't have here a slide with more with more detailed theoretical analysis of our micro disks because now in this work we on micro disks, yeah, just later where we discuss um, laser fabrication, yeah. So we just discuss the rough how roughness affects. Uh, the modes position and uh, thresholds and uh, for these particular materials for this uh, particular um, technology we have to have Q factor around 1000 to have lasing from our estimation but for cubes we can have a Q factor around 15 or 20 so okay. one and a half okay. orders of magnitude lower uh, Q factor can be used for single crystalline, very accurate, uh, roughness free um, cuboids. I see. Uh, very, uh, very uh, detailed answer. Thank you. But second, the question is about uh, uh, 
uh, laser which is grown on top of nano wave guides which are normally oriented with respect to this this laser i don't uh, understand i did not catch the point how you control the location of these nano wave guides why they do not intersect uh, how you control the amount of these wave guides so uh, please yeah uh, thanks uh, uh, so as i told yeah chemical methods they're quite random so in this case we have a lot of uh, uh, examples of different uh, differently grown micro lasers with different waveguides and then we have simultaneously thousands of them uh, yes. and then we can uh, we can um, test different ones and uh, from scientific point of view this is quite good so we have a lot of de design designs just after a couple of minutes but regarding the technology yeah this is, uh, still have to be optimized Ah, now I see. So it's uh, more for scientific purposes uh, rather than for 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 uh, uh, for uh, um, real use. <laughs> uh, yeah, of course, this is a first, just first demonstration. Yeah, of such uh -huh. integration with gallium phosphide. So in this work, this is important to 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 show uh, that uh, this is, this integration is possible. Mm -hmm. and uh, the gallium phosphide is a good material so uh, with the integration of gallium phosphide nanovirus with perovskites uh, was demonstrated for the first time and uh, it, it was shown um, that it was it, it works even uh, during tuna, tuna, like tuning spectral tuning of these uh, micro lasers because uh, gallium phosphide is transparent in green range and red range so uh, this was the purpose of um, this work what do you think if we uh, preliminary uh, uh, prepare an array of notches uh, on this uh, micro laser will it help to uh, to fix the positions of nano wave guides yes so some pre patterning uh, pre -pattern. yeah, it, it was done yeah by uh, several groups before us and yeah it works so pre, pre patterned uh, substrates uh, are also very promising for Con chemic controllable chemical growth of the micro lasers or nano lasers mm -hmm. so maybe in the future the next step should be like pre-patterning of the surface yeah. like to create seeds for growth of these um, uh, micro lasers or nano lasers yeah. in the certain positions and then uh, we can even uh, by lithography or even pre prepare um, prepare some wave guides or photonic chip in advance and then grows uh, like uh, grow the perovskite lasers uh, in the place where we, we need but it's we have to play it with the hydrophobicity of the surface and to like to push perovskites to grow in a certain place this is yeah. the main issue yeah. or yeah. maybe open there were some works on opening of uh, uh, by resist some place where we have to work and then uh, uh, after growing of the micro laser in some place then this resist just dis dissolve and we have uh perovskite grown on certain place wherever we want so in principle i believe it's doable so it, uh -huh, it needs a lot uh -huh. of yes. efforts yeah but but it's doable. yeah thank you very much for for your excellent talk uh bye bye yeah thanks but i will continue i'm not finished yet of course of course uh, <laughs> it's, uh me myself i leave ah okay okay yeah. thanks a lot uh, yeah i have again, yeah, we are a little bit limited time. on time uh, yeah, I, I have just three, four slides. No more. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, next slide, please. Yeah, so uh, uh, for more flexible, so a bit more flexible approach rather than uh, face plates is the projection lithography. And the guys in Vladivostok, they um, developed this technique and applied to our samples uh, to, f to create uh, my, uh, different shapes. For instance, you see here that different holes uh, of different shape can be can can form different shapes i mean different field distribution on uh, on a sub, on substrate yeah on the perovskite film and then we can cut different shapes different gratings nano holes with size down to 215 nanometers so grating with period down to 400 nanometers so please next slide yeah so there is some demonstration on diffraction grating some surface coloring some uh, hidden uh, and uh, imprinting of information, for instance, this QR code can be visible uh, either in PL re uh, e regime, so when we radiated by UV light, 
or by some uh, uh, oriented, oriented uh, illumination by white light. So next slide, please. Yeah, and more importantly that uh, this large upscaling technique can be applied for creation of super lens laser. So here we see some uh, demonstration of cutting by rectangular laser beam. We can cut uh, nanowires with a cross section less than emitting wavelengths. So wavelength is around 800 nanometers, as you can see from the spectra on the uh, left bottom, uh, on the figure B or E, sorry, and. Um, and uh, the size is a cross section of this nanovirus is around 500 nanometers, so it is quite super lens. And all thermal uh, conductivity of perovskites um, are lost to, uh, to preserve uh, light emitting properties of this perovskite even after ablation, so if the oven, after overheating of all this area, which were ablation, so for ablation, we need several hundreds. Uh, degree of Celsius, so materials is really strongly overheated, but after cooling, it again emits light quite well, and it provides even lasing. So this is first demonstration of nanovirus made not chemically, but uh, by by laser. So next slide, please. Yeah, in summary, so in principle, yeah, we uh, create uh, different building blocks for uh, for potential, yeah, for potential optical chip for uh, basically, we focused on the creation of the smallest possible perovskite lasers. Also, demonstrate their integration with waveguides, gallium phosphide waveguides, which are quite promising for uh, localization light and waveguiding for uh, distances longer than 20 micrometers. So, showed also integration with other perovskite nanoparticles and antennas. And uh, perovskites can be tuned, uh, just tunability on chip. It may be good for not only for just tunability, but also for sensing to such kind of gas. And also, yeah, and also we are happy to develop this uh, new direction of uh, direct laser imprinting of nano lasers, which is quite tricky to do, let's say, with the standard 3 5 semiconductors because of uh, overheating uh, issues. So, this can be done only mostly, I would say. Uh, not 100%, but 99% of the perovskites, because other materials, they have much, much more, uh, much higher uh, thermal conductivity. So next slide, please. Yeah, and some outlook. Uh, so to further develop this field, we have to optimize both material properties, as I told, and cavity properties. So for material scientists, there is a challenge to improve the gain of the material quantum yield of the emission from the materials. So we have to optimize density of states uh, at, uh, for levels, emitting levels. And uh, also we have to have to, local, to localize the mode. We have to have higher refractive index for uh, nanoparticles. And also new smart photonic designs uh, can be invented. Uh, to to keep high uh, quality factor and preserve good material properties. Also, this is quite multi-physical problem. And yeah, some opportunity. Maybe we, we should think about some uh, integration with non-perovskite nanostructures, as I told before. So for some pre-patterning of substrate, some creation, some uh, photonic chip, and then integration with perovskites uh, micro lasers. Of course, uh, there is an, still the challenge to achieve electrically pump lasing uh, in visible range at room temperature with any material. And so we have to work on lowering the threshold uh, and optimize uh, thermal sink uh, because for lasing application, thermal conductivity of uh, low thermal conductivity, lower than glass, for instance, is a big uh, problem. And it should be also maybe optimized by thermal sink or by internal properties of new new materials, or maybe perovskite, maybe uh, something perovskite like, I don't know. So there are a lot of issues and uh, yeah, and uh, uh, to, to, to create such uh, uh, high quality integrated uh, nano lasers. And uh, finally, yeah, so uh, once this problem is quite multi-physical, so we have uh, uh, provided some forums for 
uh, multi-physical community from chemists uh, from to, 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 to so we organize a, uh, our school so please participate and now we decided to uh, to organize it uh, in online format so can you push the button please yeah so uh, yeah can you yeah so it's now it's online and most of the speakers uh, agreed preliminary to to deliver their talks in end of july uh, june so please uh, you're welcome to participate in this school and uh, also where we have a lot of discussions on the light emitting materials and some advanced photonic devices uh, so thank you for your attention sergey thank you very much um uh, sorry now. for for my problems with the laptop so really oh, it's, it's okay the issues with the online format uh, so may happen uh, so guys if you have any questions please raise raise your hands or type your questions to the to the chat while we are waiting Sergey if you allow me to so to ask so you've been talking about whispering gallery modes uh, cut by the laser I'm wondering um, are you sure that you have those whispering gallery resonances there since you may have this in plane Fabri Perot resonances so in order to prove that you are dealing with whispering gallery uh, you probably should uh, uh, should first of all examine the Q factor as a function of the diameter of the cavity and probably in the luminescence you, you should have uh, multiple resonances with the distance between them which is governed by the very simple rules. So are you sure that you have this uh, whispering gallery effect instead of this, for example Fabri Perot or something or me? You mean in micro discs? Yeah, yeah, micro discs. So when yeah, you have to prove yeah, that so, it's uh, gallery. Yeah, this is a very important question. And sorry, I uh, didn't add a very important slide, which I, from time to time I show it because it shows all our physics, uh, so all calculations uh, provided by um, Andrei Bogdanov, yeah, who is expert <laughs> in micro disc lasers. And uh, yeah, actually, we believe uh, because. We what we, we we have done so we studied um, the dependence of quality factors of the most I mean the, the highest quality factors possible in this design is taking into account real roughness so we simulate the micro disc with roughnesses and so, and uh, found uh, found out that the level of our roughness it's somewhere close to like critical yeah if we would have a bit more rough um micro disc we we don't have any visible in the remote or fabri -Piro. i would say this fabri -Piro like resonances uh, in such thin uh, thin uh, micro disc which is the thickness around let's say uh here is around 700 nanometers so it's uh, like lambda in free space yeah or just several lambda if we divide to refractive index so in this case these uh, fabri -Piro resonances are very weak but uh, whispering gallery modes are very sensitive to roughness, and also we can uh, we can from optical images we see that we have uh, outcoupling like rings ring like outcoupling yeah. So uh, and it, it indication this is indication of um, of uh, that modes leaves on the border of of the discs so propagating along there. But again, they are outcoupled at the at the roughness, uh, the defects, and the defects are at the edges. For this yes. reason, so I would say that and you have to study on the top as a as well. so, mm -hmm. uh, There is a roughness on the, on the top as well. The same roughness mm -hmm. and the edges, the same. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. but I would say if you if you show that it's whispering gallery, so that will show you the dependence of the Q factor on the radius. At some point, it will saturate yes. due to the roughness of the edges. Yes, uh, so the, uh, the the minimum uh, diameter where we observe lasing was around. Uh, uh, two microns. I showed, yeah, this. Uh -huh. So two microns, not less than two microns, unfortunately. Okay, but you did, did, did the threshold uh, shift uh, with the increase of the size of the of the cavity? Uh, I think no. Maybe uh, the, it depends on the uh, on the uh, beam size. Yeah, we have to uh -huh. irradiate it homogeneously. For that, we we have to have a quite uh, powerful laser. Yeah. If you focus locally, you can um, excite on the small micro disc. Of course, if you would start to work with 30 micrometer disc, you cannot, uh, in our experimental conditions, you cannot uh, irradiate it homogeneously. In this case, yeah. threshold will be different. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Uh, so again, we have a, a question from Ivan Yers from the chat. So he heard that uh, in the field of integrated lasers, they usually quite uh, yeah, they are usually quite interested in the modulation properties of the structures. Uh, the so maximum frequency you can efficiently modulate the intensity. Do, uh, do you have any estimates on that as compared to conventional uh, gallium arsenide? You mean modulate uh, intensity of uh, uh, lasers? Mm. Directly, yeah, but the, oh, oh. yeah. The, the, the question is about the uh, the intensity pump. In that, I think about the uh, how fast you can modulate the intensity. Uh, yes. So uh, we didn't try, but uh, recent work of uh, maybe you saw some work of Kirshar uh, with some Chinese strong Chinese team uh, in, from Shenzhen. And they um, showed on PIC uh, the regime of fast modulation of vortex lasers uh, made of perovskites. And they showed a uh, picosecond scale of uh, like modulation of such distributed feedback laser made of perovskite. In our particular design uh, micro, mic of micro lasers, I didn't see any works on the modulation so far. So okay, another question, uh, Vanya. Could you so? Um, so what are the possible uh, possible routes uh, towards electrical pump? Yeah. So we, I, I believe the first of all we have to passivate all defects as much as we can. There are still some defects on the surface, and. Uh, after that, when we realize that we have the lowest possible uh, threshold for like optical pump, uh, so we can start to think about electrical pump. But before that, so we now we, sh we showed a femtosecond laser pump. So this is uh, the easiest way to pump laser, any laser. Then uh, now we are working on CW pump. A CW, also, this results in overheating, so we have to work, start to work in low temperature regime. Then we have to increase the temperature, optimize design, and achieve lasing at room temperature at CW pump, so continuous wave pump. And after optimization of thermal thing, after optimization of um, material properties, again, we have to put some contacts. <laughs> it's another issue. Uh, after putting some contacts, since they're metallic, the, the, some lasers automatically become uh, plasmonic because, <laughs> because your contacts is metallic. So um, yeah, this is a big, uh, big challenge. And in principle, this way was like um, this. This some of these problems were overcome by uh, with different materials. So we know how we have to do what we have to do. But perovskites have some specific uh, some features which uh, modify the problem a little bit. So. And in principle, in our team, we are, I believe we will able to, 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 mm -hmm. uh, to work on it. So, and find a solution, finally. Okay, Sergey, thank you. Colleagues, any other questions? Uh, so before we thank the speaker, I would like uh, to announce our next seminar will be in two weeks since in a week we have a, a day off the first of May uh, And in two weeks, I really hope uh, That uh, we will have a seminar by Ramon Paniaga Dominguez from Singapore um, Working in the group uh, headed by Arsenia Kutnetsov. So he's the main theoretician there uh, So I hope that he will be talking about uh, uh, active all dielectric nanophotonics nana um, so anyway, I would like to thank everyone for their for your patience. Uh, sorry about the technical issues. Hopefully we have solved them somehow. And uh, thanks everyone for coming. And I would like to thank uh, Sergei for uh, for the for the seminar. You can clap your hands. I've just switched off this uh, on the sound. Sergei, thank you very much. Thank you, Sergei. Thank you.